Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you have allowed us to have to gather to encourage one another as we enjoy fellowship and we build up as we listen to your word being expounded, as we are being taught how to understand the Bible as one big book, one big story. And we pray that you will speak to us even now as we listen to your word. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. I was asked not to start again by telling you that you are foolish, so I will just have a very soft and gentle start here. I guess by now we have all kind of got the idea that the whole Bible really tells one big story with Jesus at its center. But some of us might still wonder if it's legitimate to read the Old Testament mainly in its function as a pointer to the message of the New Testament. So, to put it differently, is the Old Testament really telling its own story? a story that we might learn something from? Or is the Old Testament ultimately written down, even that the events of the Old Testament take place with us in mind? What do you think? How do you read your Old Testament? As a story of the past that might teach us some helpful lessons? Or as something that happened and was written down for us. That's the point of the text we will be looking at now. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Um, in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 10, in the first 13 verses, Paul mentions five experiences of Old Testament Israel, and he refers to four disasters of the same people. And he claims that all that was written down for our instruction so that we may learn from them. Before we get into the text, let me just very briefly touch on the context. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 really stands in a, in a broader, longer uh, context. An excursus that Paul begins in chapter 8, where he talks about Christian freedom, uh, especially as it refers to eating meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul, Paul defends Christian freedom, but he also points to some limitations of, of where this freedom needs to end. One, one issue that he addresses, obviously, is, is that we should forsake our freedom if it becomes a stumbling block for someone else. But then, secondly, he also points out that Christian freedom has its limits there where we could where we could do something that would bring dishonor to the Lord. So where we might actually turn towards things that might, things that might lead us into idolatry. And that's really what Paul then was concerned about at the end of chapter 9, where he very personally talks about his concern to serve the, the Lord wholeheartedly. Uh, he understands that half-heartedness might be an indication that we are not truly converted. And that we therefore might be disqualified to enter into God's glory. And he says, I want to make sure that's not me. And then in, in the beginning of chapter 10, he then turns to the Corinthians and said, and you also make sure that's not you. That's really what he's doing here in this, in this passage. He, he warns them not to rely on external things, not on past experiences for their salvation. It's a warning passage. I want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13 for us. Uh, so listen as I read God's holy and inerrant word. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us. 
that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he, that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with a temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's our text for today. Four points. I give you an outline right at the beginning so that you know where we're going. Um, four points, always E. I was told yesterday that every good sermon has three points. So, so be prepared. It's not a good sermon. Um, <laughs> point number one, five experiences. Point number two, four examples. Point number three, one exhortation. And finally, point number four, one encouragement. Examples, uh, experiences, examples, exhortation, encouragement. Uh, the main point of all that I will be saying is that we should learn from the failures of Old Testament Israel so that we will not commit idolatry but will persevere in faith until the end. Very simple. We should learn from the failures of Old Testament Israel so that we will not commit idolatry but will persevere in faith until the end. So let's look first at five at the first five verses and five great, great experiences of Old Testament Israel. Uh, it's really referring to these uh, five experiences in the first four verses, um, and he's uh, using the word all five times. So we, we, we won't be able to go into much detail here, uh, but, but I trust you will quickly realize we are talking about typology. There are types, types, things that happen um, that relate to things that Christians have experienced. Um, right at the beginning, it's interesting, and Paul re, uh, calls the Old Testament Israel our fathers, as he writes to the Corinthians, uh, because that was a question yesterday. Uh, I think we, we have to realize, P Paul assumes that these probably non-Jewish background believers uh, understand that they are in the line of Old Testament Israel. They are our fathers. Um, and then he reminds the Christians in Corinth about things that Old Testament Israel experienced during the time of the Exodus. So, so he, he reminds them um, of Exodus 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. That's the first reference we see here, right? That, that they were all... Uh, under the cloud. And, and then they all passed through the sea. And that's, that's referring back to Exodus 14, 22, uh, where it says, And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand, on their left hand. And, and then Paul refers to this great act of salvation, God rescuing his people out of Egypt, as a baptism into Moses. It's interesting, in the Old Testament we don't find, at least from all I know, we, we don't find the Exodus being referred to as a baptism. But very clearly, Paul understands this is what is going on here. It's exactly the same thing, going through the water into being saved. And so, and, and, and so he's, he's, he's making this connection to help the Corinthians to see, oh, that refers to us. 
We have been rescued by the kindness of God. Just as, as God visited his people in Egypt and went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, so, so God visited his people in Jesus Christ, and, and he's leading us into freedom. Uh, he is leading us through the water of baptism as a sign of, of salvation. So in a way, the, the first aspect that, that Paul is looking at is, is saying, look at the Exodus, look at what happened there. And do you understand how this is a pointer, this experience of Old Testament is a pointer to, to what we have experienced too. And, and, and then he's, he's saying to the Corinthians, not, not just that we experience these things as, as Old Testament Israel did, but also in, in the other ordinance we have, in the Lord's Supper, we, we share in an experience in an even greater way that Old Testament Israel had. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Now we understand it's manna from heaven, it's water that came out of a rock. But again, he's, he's referring to these things as types of something greater. It's, it's slightly puzzling if we read here that he says that the rock followed them. Um, we are not entirely sure what that means because we, we don't read in the Old Testament about a rock following them. Uh, but we, we read twice about a rock that Old Testament encountered in the desert, once at the beginning and once at the end, and water came out of the rock, provided supernaturally by God. Um, and while probably smarter minds than mine can give you better explanations, I think if we think about a people being 40 years in the desert and God telling us at the beginning of the desert time, at the end of the desert time, how they were able to survive by, by supernatural provision of water, these were probably not the only two rock events and water events. Uh, ultimately, the Lord provided for his people so that they were able to live, so that they had drink. Now, we understand this is obviously, again, just in, in a way, it's, it's real history, and yet it's, it's, a, it's a typology. When, when, when Jesus says in John 7, 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He is the provision of, of the water we really need. And that's, that's what the author is saying. The rock that followed them was Christ. Now again, there, there's a lot we could say about this, but but I think it's very clear that God was providing for his people in the desert, and he is providing in much greater ways for his people even today, through Christ. So we, we see how these experiences during the Exodus foreshadow the gospel, how, how they point us to what God has done for the Corinthians and for us. And that's all very interesting. So far, if I would be a Corinthian just sitting there in the church in Corinth and the letter Paul sent is being read, I'm saying, oh, that's interesting, that's great. And I can see myself in this great line of history. And then we hear, the, we hear these shocking words in verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So, so Paul is saying, guys, be careful. All these great experiences can be meaningless. We, we, we can share in some external benefits like baptism or the Lord's Supper. We, we can have experienced some external stuff, and yet we might not find the Lord's pleasure. So in a way... Paul is saying, remember Israel, remember Israel, remember the generation that experienced God's great act of salvation, the exodus, and remember what happened to them. Their great experiences weren't of any lasting benefits to them. When Paul is saying that the Lord was not pleased, with most of them, it's pretty, much, it's pretty much all of them, right? Only two 
adults, Joshua and Caleb, made it into the promised land. So up until this point, the Corinthians might say, well, that's bad for them. But, but he, he says, look, guys, this is not just that I'm telling you that happened back then. That has a meaning for you. This is, this is hugely relevant for us to think about. Verse, verse 6. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. You see, the Old Testament written for you so that you don't follow the wrong path of Old Testament Israel. We'll think more about this when we come to verse 11. But I think for, for now we should simply understand that the history of Old Testament Israel should cause us not to put too much confidence in our experiences. They had five great experiences that we just read about, and he's telling us it's of no benefit to them. And then he goes on, and he's drawing some Concrete lessons from four spectacular sins. So after five experiences, we are now coming to four examples. Four examples that should really warn us. And that's verses 7 to 10. Uh, these four examples follow the same pattern. The first one, not completely, but the other three are very clear. It's always uh, first a warning. Don't follow Israel in a particular sin. And then always the explanation because, remember, it had consequences. Okay, so we, we see that just quickly running through these uh, four, four examples. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, that people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Um, now, the words here pretty clearly refer to Exodus 32, the golden calf example. Uh, we, we don't read here about God's judgment, but probably because that is the most or the best-known um, example. Uh, we know how, how then Moses got the commandment to, uh, or then God, anyway, told him, and he sent out Levites to kill the idol worshippers, and 3,000 men were killed. We read at the end of chapter uh, Exodus 32 that the Lord, se Lord sent a plague. So we, we know judgment was, was part of this. Uh, so do not be idolaters, as some of them were. That's the first warning. Verse 8 we must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Uh, this references uh, Numbers 25, when many, many Israelites, and I, I quote from, from, from Numbers 25, began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Um, it's, it's obviously uh, the reference back to Numbers 25, because in Numbers 25 verse 9, we actually read that 23,000 fell in a single day. Uh, so that's exactly what we're reading here. So again, reminding them of not just sexual immorality, but, but again, sexual immor immorality that led ultimately to idolatry. Then in verse 9, a third example from Israel's history. Um, and again, we read about the presence of Christ in the Old Testament here in an interesting way. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Uh, the Old Testament reference here is, is Numbers 21. When the people complained about a lack of, of water and, 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 and food, and God just had enough of all their grumbling and complaining, and he sent venomous snakes that killed many. And I think, especially with verse 4 in mind, that, that Christ was a rock from which the water flowed. We can see how this grumbling, this complaining about a lack of water, um, is, is really uh, putting Christ to the test. There's probably much more to it. Uh, we, we could look at this passage and, and see how it's quoted in John 3, but I, I won't go there. I think that's good enough for now. Fourth lesson uh, from, the, from Old Testament Israel during their desert years. We see that in verse 10. 
nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Um, Israel grumbled all the time, so it's, it's not entirely clear what this is referring to. But, but probably the, the most dramatic incident was at the end of number 16 when, when God sent his judgment over the grumbling people uh, and 14,700 men died on a single day. So all we are seeing here is that Paul ultimately is, is drawing from Old Testament examples, from experiences that the Exodus generation had. And, and he's, he's telling the Corinthians, don't start dreaming of being safe just because of some past experience. Remember Israel. They had great experiences too. But they displayed their lack of faith. By their idolatry, by their immorality, by their grumbling, and God judged them. So now that leads us to our third point. One great exhortation that we should heed. And that's verses 11 and 12. Uh, we see here really how, how Paul now applies the experiences and examples from Old Testament Israel to his New Testament audience. When he says, now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So I think verse 11 has the potential to re revolutionize your reading of the Old Testament. It, it, it's really fascinating what Paul is writing here. It, it's good to, to realize what, what Paul is not saying. He's not saying that the Old Testament is, is like a letter that someone wrote to someone else and you listen into. And you can draw as a historian, as you look back at what happened back then, you might draw some helpful conclusions for yourself out of it. He's not saying it's in some ways useful for us to read the Old Testament. But Paul is saying the Old Testament was written for you. You should read it. The things that happened, they were written down for our instruction. And so my, my plea for today is the same that I ate last night. Christian, read your Old Testament. The Old Testament is not the story for some other people from some other time. It is written down for our instruction. God wants to talk to you. He has something to say to you. So let him speak to you. And realize that he is not talking past you to some other people in some other time. He's actually talking to you. So listen. Listen to what he has to say. And just to be very clear, now you might think, well, he's, he has something to say to the Corinthians. Well, obviously, it's not just to them. Uh, who, who else are the people on whom the end of the ages has come? It's clear an eschatological focus here. Uh, yes, it's Corinthians, and it's us, and it will be all people until Christ returns. Now, I, I want to go into in a, in a brief excurs, just helping us to see First, two, New Testament, two other New Testament passages that help us to see that this is not some innovative idea that Paul just drops in here on the, on the Corinthians. Peter is saying the same thing. He, he is saying that the Old Testament was written for us. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 uh, to 12. Concerning this salvation, our salvation in Christ, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, 
things in which angels long to look. So Peter agrees. Peter agrees. The Old Testament prophets wrote and served us. And, and Jim mentioned twice, I think, yesterday, uh, Romans 15, verse 4. So for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Again, the same words. That's through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So the Old Testament is written for us. It's written so that we can learn from it. It is written to point us to Christ and to keep us close to Christ. And I thought it might be helpful, um, just as a very brief excursus, to, to give you a few ways how you can, when you come to an Old Testament text, think about how does this text point me to Christ? Uh, obviously, we have heard about one way a lot, typologies. So we are looking for types. And, and, and Jim pointed out typologies are, are, are not just where we see a New Testament reference very obviously saying this is a type. Uh, we believe that Jesus and the apostles really wanted us not just to, to show some tricks, how they can pull out something that you really shouldn't do otherwise. I, they are trying to inform our hermeneutics, how we should read. The Old Testament. So typologies, um, we, we need to be careful with them, but that's a way to, to see a gospel connection in the Old Testament. Uh, one thing we see here, I think, is, is even more contrasts. Contrasts. They did this, but that didn't go well. So learn from it. Um, we see themes, themes that go through the whole Bible. And, and we, we can, can look at them and take hold of them, often by means of systematic theology, seeing a connection there from, from God is the same, God's character is the same, his, his attributes are the same, but, but they are revealed in Christ. So as you see a theme, as you see an attribute of God, that can move you to the New Testament. And obviously, one way that's very obvious is by, by virtue of both progressive revelation and, and really the development of redemptive history. Uh, that will lead you from an Old Testament text to Christ and then ultimately to his coming back. Fulfillment of divine promises is another way. Uh, I think we, we, we see a lot of promises in the Old Testament. Whenever you find a promise, think of what Paul is writing to the Corinthians, that in Christ all the promises of God find their yes and amen. So, so look at that. And obviously the law. We, we see the law is always pointing us to Christ because the law shows us our inability to do what God has required us to do. So we, we need the one who fulfilled the law, the one who is the wisdom that we don't have, as we just heard in the last lecture. Uh, so we are looking to Christ. Uh, so the law ultimately is a pointer, as a, as, as, um, and now I'm lacking the English word, Galatians 3, our teacher, tutor, um, that points us to Christ. So, so, so that just as a brief excursus, I hope that's a bit helpful to, to think through as you read your Old Testament. Look at, at, is there any of these ways or are there several ways and what is the most legitimate way to preach the gospel from the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament was written for us. And we need to preach the gospel from the Old Testament. Because if, if I would stop now here, this message does not have much hope for us, does it? It wouldn't. Even, even what Paul is doing here so far, he's just showing us, in a way, our inability. He's telling us, do better than Old Testament Israel. Will you? Well, thankfully, Paul concludes with one encouragement. When, when Paul has warned the Corinthians and ultimately us against all inappropriate inappropriate self-confidence against any wrong confidence in some external experience we once had, he is now pointing us to our faithful God, a God who will persevere with us if we are truly His. So in His kindness, He wants us. It's, it's the kindness of God that He wants us through the Old Testament story. And through New Testament passages like this, God is warning us. And in His fatherly care, 
he speaks words of comfort and encouragement to us, as, as we read in verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right at the beginning of, of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul had praised God, said, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. So, so Paul is aware that the Corinthians had experienced grace, grace in Christ. The Christ who alone lived the perfectly righteous life. The one who was never an idolater, who was always living the way we all should have lived. And then who died in our place, in the place of sinners, of idolaters, of half-hearted people. He died in our, in our place. And he overcame death. He was raised to life again. And, and then Paul concludes his initial prayer in, in 1 Corinthians 1, which is, which is expressing his confidence in, in God's continuing work in the Corinthians. So it's not by their own strengths. He says, He praises God for the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, same words, by whom you were called in the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul has a great confidence, not in the Corinthians, but in the God of the Corinthians, in our God. But he who began a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And in order to do this, to complete His good work in you and me, our great God has given us His Word, Old Testament and New Testament. In one way, how God perseveres with us and keeps us close to Himself is by warning us. It's one wonderful way how, how God in His fatherly love cares for us. He has given us His word for our instruction so, so that we find salvation in Christ Jesus and so that we will flee all temptations, so that we do not commit idolatry, but will persevere in faith to the end. Let me pray for that. Lord God, we thank you that you are a faithful God. We thank you that you have done for us what Old Testament Israel failed to do. We thank you that you have done for us what we are failing to do all the time. Thank you that you have kept the law. Thank you that you have lived the perfect and righteous life we should have lived. And we thank you that you have given us now your spirit, the spirit who enables us to fight temptation, a spirit who convicts us of sin and helps us to turn back to you, and the spirit who has sealed us so that we will, if we are truly yours, never be lost, but will be safe in you because you are faithful. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times, now and forevermore. Amen.